Welcome to Smash the Class, a podcast that discusses topics in education from an anarchist perspective. This project is part of the Anarchist Pedagogies Network, which seeks to create a space for anyone interested in anarchist education, regardless of expertise or background. For this, our first episode, I'll be your host, Nicole, and I'll be talking to Andrew. He's an anarchist from Trinidad and Tobago who has, for more than a year now, been creating videos for his YouTube channel, Saint Andrewism, in which he investigates a wide range of topics, including youth liberation and education. In fact, it was his video about homeschooling that really caught our attention. In this conversation, we explore his unique educational experiences and how they have helped shape his politics. At the same time, we also look at how homeschooling could provide one of many answers to the common question of how people will learn in an anarchist society. I really recommend that, after listening to this episode, you go check that one out. Anyway, all that said, let's get into the interview. Anyway, it's like, I'm actually really excited to be able to talk to you about like the homeschooling video that you had put out. Um, right. Especially because like, this is an area where personally, I don't have a lot of experience for it. Um, mostly because like, I went to a public school for my entire, entire career. Um, right. So- so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, let's talk a little bit about your personal experience. Right. Well, I mean, my personal experience homeschooling was, well, it was very varied um, from when we began to where we ended up. There was a lot of experimentation going on and um, a lot of different styles were attempted, um, some more successful than others. Um, But what I ultimately settled on personally, because, you know, each person in my family would have had a different experience. Um, The style that I had settled on personally near the end um, really, really worked for me and really established what I would say is a good foundation for the rest of my life. And what kind of style was it that you finally settled on? Right. So I sort of um, ended up in a self-schooling sort of approach to it. Of course, I did get assignments and stuff from my mom, um, but those usually... I would get up early and take care of those and finish those in like an hour or two. (laughs) And then I would basically have the rest of the day to pursue what I was interested in learning to do or interested in what I was interested in learning about. Um, And so I was just able to pursue them. Um, I dabbled in a lot of different things, sort of a jack of all trades, renaissance man approach to things. But um, at least I can say now that I have a, shallow um uh familiarity with a lot of different things so like whenever you were kind of setting your own self-schooling like what guided your goals or your choices um i mean it was really just what i was interested in obviously other than the stuff i was assigned um and so for most of that what i was interested in was related to um communication studies and was related to art and particularly writing. I spent a lot of my time writing short stories and books and, you know, just creative projects that I never really finished. But in retrospect, you know, that helps me to hone and develop my abilities. So I'm really happy about that. I did also dabble a bit um, in some science related stuff. I very briefly got into coding. Um, not enough to be able to put two lines of code together and also a lot of Spanish though I am not close to fluent yet (laughs) so it really sounds like there was a lot of very open uh, like open opportunities for you to be able to kind of go through a lot of different options Um, yeah did this kind of change for like your siblings so my siblings were and are still on, you know, completely different trajectories from me. I'm the only one in my family who really 
took on that self-schooling model sort of head on because um, one of my siblings ended up going back into school so that he could do labs in school uh, because he was very science oriented. Um, And then the others ended up going down different paths. So it really, the self-schooling model really only happened to work for me as an individual. Because I, as an individual, I mean, my mom trusted me to have that internal drive to push myself to get those things done. Whereas the others were a bit, they required a little bit more guidance, at least according to the standards of, you know, what our education system expects, which, you know, homeschooling is still influenced by because we live in a society. (laughs) Yeah, that's kind of an unfortunate side effect, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the full freedom of homeschooling or self-schooling or alternative schooling, um, it's difficult for it to be completely realized because it still exists in the context of capitalist society. I would say, and one of the questions I would have from that is just like, so I guess it kind of requires like some familiarity. So you're welcome to tell me if you're not sure. But I was going to say like, what kind of homeschooling structures were there available to you, like in the country? Well, we're not really limited by country or borders, whatever the case may be. So, you know, we had a lot of there are a lot of different styles available to us. There are a lot of different homeschooling styles, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's de schooling, of course, um, which is a style that's really removes itself, pulls away from basically everything you expect from traditional expl- from traditional schooling, um, all those learned attitudes and behaviors. Um, there's, of course, traditional sort of approach. Um, this basically mirrors the school style of public schools. You, know, you have your textbooks and your workbooks and your tests and your homework and all that jazz. Um, There's, of course, the classical method, uh, which is based on the trivium. And for those unfamiliar, the trivium is a sort of a learning style that's split into three stages. The grammar stage, which is where um, people are able to, from the age of six to ten, are able to absorb and memorize certain facts. So that's the sort of soak in knowledge stage. Um, The dialectical stage, dialectic stage from ages eight, from ages 10 to 12, tends to emphasize the logic and the whys behind facts. So that's the sort of grow in understanding phase. And then the rhetoric stage from ages 13 to 18, um, that's what adds in the persuasive use of language and basically bearing fruit um, in wisdom. There's also the Charlotte Mason style, which um, is very much focused on like, looking at a wide variety of subjects and looking at like narration and storytelling and that sort of thing. Um, At least Charlotte Mason is one I'm less familiar with. So if I'm wrong, you all can call me out. Um, There's the unit studies approach, which would arrange um, all the subjects around a common theme and usually has a lot of hands-on projects. So, for example, the theme is ocean or something. You would have, like, in math, you would learn about volume and fluid and ounces and all those kind of things. Um, in bio, you probably learn about the different species. You know, in in language arts or whatever, you might, like, learn to write about, um, write reports on animal behavior or something like that and so on and so forth through all the different subjects geography you might learn where um how ocean geography affects certain things um civics you might learn about how the ocean impacts politics and so on and so forth um and there's also of course the unschooling style which is um not particularly structured um and it's very child directed and, all, and there's also the Montessori style, which focuses on like self-direction and self-regulation and facilitating the valuation of 
knowledge within students. Oh, and also the eclectic method, which sort of combines different approaches, which is very much what my family had done with all of us, because we ended up pulling from different curriculums and styles and structures over the years. <laughs> so you just definitely preempted my question, because I was going to ask, like, like how you felt yours was more put together. Yeah. <laughs> we were very eclectic. So we did a lot of, um, we had a reading based curriculum at one point. And then we mix that in with like a workbook based curriculum. And then my other siblings ended up with a more, um, I guess, de-schooled kind of approach, a uh, very much hands-on sort of approach. Um, and then there's also some elements of like the classical style with the trivium in there. Cause I remember learning about like, um, fallacies and, logical reasoning and that kind of thing. So that played a role as well. Although it did end up, I want to say, um, biting them in the butt later on because <laughs> I ended up like not believing in their faith by applying those sort of like critical thinking skills. So yeah. <laughs> Which perfectly leads into, um, like, how does, like, okay, so you just mentioned, like, that you kind of started not believing because of those critical thinking skills, but what were other ways of homeschooling kind of impacted your family over time? Good question. Um, I mean, there are a lot of positives and negatives to that, right? Um, I would say that as a positive, you know, we had a lot of free time because we weren't restricted to, you know, commutes and um, all the chores related to preparing for school the next day and, you know, um, spending so much time in work, um, at, at work and at school. Um, so we had a lot more free time. We were working at our own pace. And so that allowed us to have a bit more flexibility. Um, there were days that were more relaxed, um, days where I certainly procrastinated on the stuff that I was more self-directed with. Um, I was raised by the internet in some respects, which is, is, is a bit of a, it was a mixed bag with that as concern. Um, Cause you know, you had all this free time, you spent a lot of it on the internet, although they wanted to avoid that. I still ended up doing it anyway. Um, and well, that will obviously influence your growth in particular ways. Um, but I, I see it as an overall positive because I was exposed to a lot of things that they wouldn't have exposed me to because of their faith. Um, there was some element of flexibility in terms of travel as well. You know, we were able to go out to more trips and not necessarily, we weren't like, hopping on planes and going overseas all the time. But we did have a bit more flexibility where that was concerned to like go around the country, that is. Um, we also were able to sort of direct our skills towards like entrepreneurial pursuits, which of course, as a self-avowed anarchist, <laughs> sounds a bit bad now, but it was more about um, facilitating our ability to be um, adaptable in this society, being able to adjust to, I mean, my parents aren't like socialists or anything, but I think a part of them understood that the economy is not um, a safe place. And, you know, we wouldn't want, they didn't want us to end up having to like, waste away in like wage labor and stuff. They wanted us to figure out a way so that like, if there was something we were passionate about, we would be able to uh, practice that from an early age. So we might be able to monetize it and be able to survive off of our own labor, basically, without having to work for a boss or that kind of thing. Of course, that has its issues, but we don't have to get into all that right now. Um, <laughs> Another positive, um, I would say, was that we had this homeschool group that we were a part of. And so that had like a really great element of community to it. You know, we would meet once a week at someone's house. 
we would hang out, we would chat, we would play games, um, we would learn cooking and crafting skills and that's it, that sort of thing. Um, and we also had like family days and graduations and Christmas parties and that kind of thing. So that was the bonds developed there were really meaningful. Um, but more on the negative side, because I'm talking about a lot about the positives and neutrals here. On the negative side, um, I guess this is more of a neutral, but spending a lot of time together. <laughs> um, that, I mean, ultimately, I think everybody needs their time alone, time away from the family and that sort of thing. Um, but when you're homeschooled, you don't get that as much. I mean, they try to create spaces like around the house where we could just go to be alone and that kind of thing. But obviously, you're still in the house. So someone's still going to call, someone's still going to knock on the door, um, that sort of thing. So sometimes, you know, you just have to go and take a walk. You know? No, I completely uh, agree. Because I'm definitely, even as I am now, I, I've always been like that as well. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there was also a bit of an issue with, you know, financial instability because we're by no means rich. Um, like I mentioned, of course, there was that whole religious element to it, which, you know, sort of pervades how they approach homeschooling and that kind of thing. There was a lot of emphasis on like, you know, devotions and Bible study and all those different things, um, which, you know, as I got older, it, as it was, you know, it was basically, I felt as though it was eating away at my time. Things I'd rather be doing, you know, I'd have to sit down and, you know, go through all that. But that also um, still affects them, you know, in terms of trying, they, they try their best to, with my other siblings, you know, or they try their best with my other siblings to also instill a sort of conservative Christian sort of viewpoint. And even then I hesitate to say, um, to, to use labels to describe those sort of things because so on one hand, yes, they are impacted by that heavily. But on the other hand, like most people, they can't really be reduced to one political label. So, you know, because of our background as people of color in a colonized country, there are going to be elements that are more like sort of radical in their position, even though they are conservative. So they are able to recognize, you know, the violence of colonialism and capitalism, even if they don't have all the right terminology and, you know, of white supremacy and all those different things. They can recognize those things. Um, so that's why I hesitate to put a label on them because I know, because even if it might be partially true, it's hard to reduce them to that, you know? Yeah, and like the the whole binary thing makes it yeah a little bit yeah. difficult to talk about. But like, there's just so much new. Yeah, because in all of this. people don't really. Um, I don't know if people know how to engage with nuance sometimes, especially with regards to you know the intersection of you know race with religion with you know white supremacy. You know how all those things would shape a black person in Trinidad's perspective on a variety of issues you know there's a lot of context that people may be missing so that's why i add so many qualifiers <laughs> no i i really understand because like i come from a very rural conservative background but i definitely don't ascribe much to that so right yeah <laughs> yeah and um i guess another negative would be although they did try in a lot of ways to provide social opportunities and stuff and I myself am a very outgoing and very social person. There were, of course, as they are with everyone, you know, times where you feel a bit alone, you know, um, times where you wish, you know, you could be just kind of ties back to previous thing, just kind of out of the house, you know, able to just kind of talk to somebody. Um, and I mean, getting, you know, access to a computer and then later on a phone, that helped. but. Of course, there's benefits, you know, as some people would have, you know, gone to school and had their friends they would have vented to and that kind of thing in person, you know? So, well, I wouldn't say I, I like 
suffered or atrophied socially. <laughs> of course, there were <laughs> moments where I felt a bit alone. So there's that. So like with those communities um, and also the kind of uh, the engagement that you're talking about with other people, were they easy to access, like even if you were on your own or could you, did they have to be more structured? Oh, like homeschool group. Um, yeah. I mean, for the most part, for most of the time we were in homeschool group, um, I didn't have like, not everyone had like, a phone or whatever so we mostly just saw each other in homeschool group um and it wasn't like structured when we saw each other so usually what, we, what would happen is you would go by someone's house in the morning we would play or watch a movie or chat or play a game or whatever the case may be um of course the parents tried to emphasize like no screens that kind of thing to have us like interact more um but yeah, we would interact and stuff until about lunchtime. Then we would have all have lunch. And then we would have like mini classes where we did like cooking or crafting. I kind of wish I had stuff like that in school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was so it was a good mix, I would say, of unstructured time, unstructured time. The unstructured time um outweighed the structured time. So Although, of course, you know, as children, we were always like, ugh, when we had to stop what we were doing to go and eat lunch and then go and start class and all that, especially if we were in the middle of, like, a really intense game of catch and rescue or something, <laughs> you know, or tag or whatever. No, like, I still see that now. So, like, even if you tell kids to stop their projects that they're working on in schools, they're just like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I just want to stay here. <laughs> but um but with all that in mind, I kind of want to look at like the politics of homeschooling. So like we were talking a little bit about like the conservative nature um that was part of your homeschooling experience and also just being able to, you know, build homeschooling to be a little bit more useful to I guess like an anarchist community or even anarchic values. Um so what are some directions that maybe we could use homeschooling? Uh, not directions, that wasn't the right word. <laughs> <laughs> You're basically trying to ask about the potential of homeschooling for like prefiguration, yeah. right? And also kind of looking at like the politics of that and how that intermingles, I guess. Right. So I guess I would start with sort of the politics of homeschooling, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I'll speak primarily um, on the US because I would say that America's homeschooling scene heavily influences homeschooling scenes in other countries, certainly influenced homeschooling, my homeschooling experience in Trinidad. Um, and, you know, because a lot of the curriculums come from America and that kind of thing. So I'll talk about that, right? Right. As I speak about in my video, um, homeschooling, you know, was, was pretty common in the early days. And then compulsory schooling came along with, you know, public school and that kind of thing. And of course, anarchists were engaged in like free schools and, you know, the Ferreira schools, the modern schools, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then homeschooling, as called homeschooling, came up with, you know, people like Raymond and Dorothy Moore and Ivan Illich and Paul Goodman and all those sort of things. Um, oh, and of course, John Holt. And these people, they weren't like explicitly religious, you know, in terms of their homeschooling approach. Um, they were just sort of, they wanted to facilitate, they were critical of the compulsory state schooling and they wanted to facilitate um, the kids' escape from compulsory schooling. Um, and, you know, back in those days, um, homeschoolers often had trouble with like, legal procedure and local school bo school boards and that kind of thing um but of course with the what was it called the satanic panic in yeah. the 80s <laughs> right with the, with the satanic panic in the 80s a lot of right-wing conservative christian types were very scared that their children were learning satanism and socialism in schools so they took their kids out of the schools a lot of them and developed um you know this christian homeschooling sort of milieu 
um, which is now probably the loudest of the two, even though it is younger than the previous milieu. So, I was like, I remember that growing up. <laughs> I wasn't alive back then, but <laughs> sorry, I was. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to share a bit about what that was like? So like, um, well, I was, I was born in the eighties, so like eighty five, like right in the middle. And so you know, growing up right in the middle of the satanic panic, um, it also didn't help that my parents had put me into like a kind of Southern Baptist preschool, <laughs> <laughs> which is really strange now being a, you know, an, an atheist and an anarchist and you're kind right. of like, this doesn't work. Um, <laughs> but anyway, like, so I kind of was put into that more or less, um, because there were just occasionally some times where like my family wanted to make sure that like, you know, uh, mostly my grandparents wanted to make sure that I had the correct, uh, religious upbringing <laughs> right. and also that I wasn't being influenced negatively by whatever was on TV in the eighties. Like right. I, I, I keep in mind, I was like five when the eighties <laughs> ended. Um, <laughs> but yeah, even in the nineties, there was a huge upswing in a lot of these conservative, uh, Christian evangelical people yeah. just like focus on the kids. family and stuff came up around. Yeah. Kind of thing. And just pulling their kids out of schools. And I remember like so many, like in the beginning, like kids I went to kindergarten with, I still remember like in the like first grade, second grade, third grade, some of my classes kept getting smaller because people right. like their parents were Christian evangelicals and just pulling them out. And you're just going like, where, where are my classmates? What, <laughs> what the hell happened? Right. <laughs> but yeah, like I remember a lot of that. There was even a lot of it in the schools. Um, a lot of that messaging still persists even today, which is, kind of wild <laughs> yeah yeah so this has changed <laughs> additional context yeah <laughs> thank you for that because it, it's interesting to hear it from somebody who is actually in it you know I've mm. had this sort of separate sort of like very separated analysis of it and look at it but to hear from someone who you know saw people coming out to school as a result of it that's very interesting yeah, it was even in my, like, the churches that I kind of got forced into. Like, I, I never really wanted to go, but, like, the churches I was forced into had a lot of homeschooling groups as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, get that back to the negatives, right? I mean, even the homeschool group that I was a part of, which wasn't overwhelming, like, positive for me. Um, you know, they were all Christians and all, you know, evangelical Christians. So there was that. Um <laughs> Whew. I mean, I, I, I remember, like, I grew up with, like, Adventures in Odyssey and Lamplight to Theatre and those sort of things from Focus on the Family. Like, Focus mm -hmm. on the Family was, like, a big part of my childhood. Um, But, yeah, so these sort of religious homeschoolers came about and, you know, being conservatives, they were like, I don't want the government in my business and all that <laughs> sort of thing. So... You know, they didn't cooperate with like local school boards and because they had the backing of these very financially equipped, um, you know, like groups and think tanks and organizations, they were able to push for um, free, freer um, freedom from like state oversight and that kind of thing. So they got a lot of state level freedom from government interference and that kind of thing. So these days, as a result, you know, there are what's called, let's say about three main groups of homeschoolers with some outliers and overlaps. So there are the progressives who, um, you know, would take their children out of school to free them from the constraints of traditional schooling and, you know, to sort of like allow them that unschooling experience. Um, you have the fundamentalist Christians, and there are also smaller religious groups um, involved in homeschooling as well, but I'm not too familiar with what they're about. So I'll just talk about the fundamentalist Christians. You know, they homeschool for religious reasons, you know, um, bringing the child up in the ways of the Lord and all that. And um, the third group would be people who didn't intend to homeschool, but for whatever the reason, they ended up getting into homeschooling um and yeah the religious right is of course the loudest voice in the homeschooling movement today if there even is such a thing as one homeschooling movement and um i will say though one benefit to their efforts 
um, is the lack of um, government interference and the sort of rights that they were able to secure of people to educate their own children, which of course has massive, obvious downsides because a complete lack of oversight in an individualist, capitalist, you know, rightist framework leads to a lot of abuse, a lot of, you know, uh, indoctrination and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. However, comma, obviously, public <laughs> schooling is not a solution to that. And obviously, um, the government does not know what's best for people's children, right? So there's a, again, there's nuance here that you really have to engage with in order to like fully be, take part in the conversation, you know? So I would say that, at least in the US, in the case of the US, of course, laws will vary from country to country. Um, having that freedom can be a benefit for us as anarchists. I'll get into the reasons why just now. Um, I mean, in Trinidad, for example, in our constitution, um, parents have the right to choose how their children are educated and that sort of thing. So we never really had to like fight for rights or anything like that with our concern. Um, but to speak specifically about how we can take the potential of homeschooling for more prefigurative, radical ends. Um, of course, we have to recognize that homeschooling is a very middle-class phenomenon for the most part. Um, so as a result, very middle-class phenomenon and is in many parts a very religiously driven phenomenon. So as a result, you know, the politics involved in that are going to be, you know, it's in within the capitalist um, framework, whether it be liberal or conservative or around there. Um, obviously, when it comes to homeschooling, it's very financially precarious, even for middle class families. Um, there's often the case where the mother is usually expected to, who's usually the educator, is usually expected to still pick up some sort of something on the side to supplement if the breadwinner can't completely sustain the home um that was something we saw through the pandemic even with like the remote learning yeah yeah there's there's definitely a very heavy gender component to that Mm -hmm. and you know navigating those gender politics is extremely important you know even if you have your anarcho family um you might want to interrogate that whole assumption that certain members of that family are expected to take on that certain care work or education work role. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do, however, still think that like anarchist families could come together and um, develop homeschool groups of their own, homeschool movements of their own. Um, But the approach will obviously have to be different. And this is the more speculative side of what I'm seeing here. Um, Mm -hmm. The more conversational side of what i'm saying here because i obviously don't have all the answers and i'll be interested to hear from and sort of bounce off other anarchists to sort of um hear their side of things and how they think so i'll just present what i think for now and then afterwards we can chat about it okay um i think that considering the financial precarity of homeschooling i think an anarchist approach to homeschooling would require some sort of um, cushion of resources and support or a pool of resources that uh, the various families can draw from. Um, we also want to make sure that the experience isn't alienating or isolating. So sort of redirecting to a more um, creative and interconnected and stimulated educational experience for the kids would have to mm-hmm. be important, of course. Um, you don't just have them in their individual bubbles and then, you know, they occasionally cross over with <laughs> the other families, you know. Yeah. You want to have them integrated in a community because you want to develop their ability to engage in the community and that sort of thing. Um, also, another thing to avoid, uh, which is something that the early 20th century communes hadn't avoided, 
was mm. that sort of isolation from the wider struggle. Um, avoiding that is very important. So even if you have, you know, your little anarchist family circle, homeschool group, whatever the case may be, you know, you want it to be outward facing to some extent, mm -hmm. you know, to have these families involved in broader community efforts and broader socializing and educational um, crossbreeding with children in the community who are not able to be involved in sort of things, you know, sort of extending that education experience to those who are not as fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, because of the pandemic and lockdown in many places and remote learning and that sort of thing and working from home, I think there's some opportunities to do some like preliminary experiments with this because, mm -hmm. you know, working from home, you have a lot of time theft opportunities, a lot of flexibility, you know, you can roll off a of bed and click on the Zoom link, get into the meeting, go back to sleep, you know, that kind of thing. I, I um, was certainly doing that in the first part of the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> so utilize those opportunities to connect with, you know, other families and connect the children, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. Experiment, see what models might work for them in terms of a virtual anarchist school model or something like that. And once lockdown and stuff lifts in many places, having sort of shared learning spaces, um, probably libraries for now, but hopefully communities in a broader sense could come together to build places for community stuff and part of that community stuff could be a space for the children to learn. Because I think, like I was saying, shared learning spaces would be important to prevent insulated small groups of individual families, right? Obviously, we have to recognize that not everyone can take their kids out to school to do this. Um, so for those who, and for anarchist families that aren't able to do this, I think it would be very important to push back against the very active and very loud conservative parents in PTA and school board spaces. Because, you know, the fight has to take place in multiple fronts, right? Mm -hmm. um, and recognizing that is, is super important. Um, obviously, we want this sort of movement, this sort of approach to be holistic, right? And um, to be prefigurative, which would mean creating alternative institutions. And alternative institutions have to be able to provide an alternative <laughs> and like a robust alternative so that people can like pull out of that sort of capitalist system. Obviously, it's eventually going to get a lot of attention if um, a school board notices that an entire <laughs> chunk of their population has suddenly vanished from their records. But I do think that like the early anarchists, we should be looking into building our own schools um, where Students are free to develop themselves. Um, that takes principles from homeschooling without mm -hmm. the flaws of atomization, religious indoctrination, social separation, that kind of thing. Um, institutions of learning, basically, where kids can be embedded in community, with their community, and involved in broader prefigurative efforts. Meaningful education, intellectual stimulation, creativity, um, and that sort of thing. In conclusion, if religious people are willing to take their kids out of school, teach them creationism, we have to fight back. And there are many ways we can do that. <laughs> exactly. <The end>. <laughs> <laughs> like that's just hitting the nail right on the head right there, because like there is um, to kind of sidetrack a little bit. But one of the things I'm kind of interested in is looking at how people talk about things like private schools versus public schools. Um, and also charter schools, because, you know, the U.S. has to be this weird one there. Uh, <laughs> and there's also this, there's always this binary thought of, like, fighting for the public school and kind of sitting there like, well, we must defend the public school because, right. like, like, it, like with this whole sort of CRT conversation, right? Yeah. With that is concerned, obviously, taking CRT, <laughs> it's not even CRT, <laughs> it's just accurate history. Oh, yeah. just <laughs> Taking that out of schools is clearly a terrible thing. Yeah. At the same and... time, however, comma, you know, there is the whole aspect of 
public school is never going to produce radicals. And and this we're building an alternative to that. We're just going to have generation after generation being recycled through this capitalist education system and having to go through the same process of unlearning all that indoctrination, where instead we should have a loud and vibrant and robust alternative to that, to both reactionary homeschooling and mm-hmm. also liberal state schooling, you know? So I'm trying to find this quote because like literally you just hit something that like has been part of my research. Right. Uh, <laughs> and um, it's by AJ Must. He was talking about like labor unions and he was working on like labor education specifically. Um, and so something that he had said was, and I'm going to quote it now, is labor needs education and must develop its own educational program and system since it would seem as silly to let your enemy run your mind as to let him run your union. In fact, it would appear obvious that if he runs your mind, he certainly will run your union too, whether your mind realizes it or not. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) And as soon as you said that, that was the first thing that just like came into my mind. And he wrote that in 1928. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Yeah, I mean, some things don't change, right? That's nearly 100 yeah. years ago. But it really is true, right? I think that um, people neglect, people have been neglecting the fight on the, well, I wouldn't say anarchists have been neglecting it because anarchists of all the socialists, I think, <laughs> have been the most involved in critiques of education and developing alternatives. But um, we can obviously carry the torch, right? So I think that, for the um child having (laughs) sorry for the that's a very awkward way of phrasing it for the parents (laughs) who are anarchists for the parents who are anarchists um i think looking into this sort of approach is good because i mean sure you may be engaging your children with you know critical thinking skills and having them to develop like a good critique i mean if you are doing that i know some people aren't which is a whole nother kind of worms but if you are engaging your children to be, you know, politically conscious and that sort of thing, um, I mean, even if they if they are still part of the public school system, they're still going to end up with problems, right? Because you're still going to end up having to be on the, I wouldn't say the, like, the back pedal, basically, basically sort of responding to what they're being taught rather than being more proactive, mm-hmm. um, reactive rather than proactive. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And that's kind of the same argument I see, like, even with the, like I mentioned, the public and private schools is that instead of actually being proactive and going, okay, what can we do? What can we do instead? How can we, you know, do something differently? Um, And we've seen it throughout the pandemic as well. Like I experienced it kind of personally a few times and it's like so much of it has been reactive. So instead of, hey, like we could try this or we could do that or, you know, um, they're just kind of going, well, we need to talk. Uh, we need to talk about mask mandates, and you're going like, "Why?" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, that's that's, the that's thing, not right? what we should be talking about. That should be there anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? Capitalism is fundamentally reactive, right? Mm-hmm. And whereas a socially anarchist society is going to be one that is proactive, so it involves a reframing in your mind of how you approach particular issues. Which is why I have this video on my channel called Why Revolution Needs Therapy. Because that unlearning process is one that you have to undergo if you want to actually engage and create a more radical society, a more socially robust society. If you are continuing to, you know, ignore, you know, those sorts of unconscious parts of yourself, um, they're going to end up coming up with sort those sorts of sort of honestly dead end approaches like fighting on the enemy's conditions and on the enemy's battleground no like that's exactly it (laughs) (laughs) but there's also something that you had mentioned um that i want to go back to because i think there's like uh Mostly because like it reminded me a lot of some of the stuff i've been reading kind of in the last couple of months (laughs) right um so you were talking kind of about like not isolating, looking outward, building commu- uh, 
building towards community efforts, kind of like, you know, going into the wider movement instead of doing what a lot of like com uh, communes had done, which was just kind of These isolating isolated themselves. pockets and bubbles, yeah. Yeah, because like a lot, I know a lot of the schools that I looked at that did this, um, yeah, they didn't turn out very well, <laughs> but... I mean, there, there are some... There are some that are pretty successful. Mm. And that's what I want to say. Um, there, are, there is, what's the word I'm looking for? There is a, a track record here. Mm -hmm. There is a precedent here in terms of having sort of alternative school institutions. Outside mm -hmm. of the anarchist modern school movement, there was also, and there is also, um, various iterations of sort of democratic schooling and free schooling and... Um, mm -hmm. Salisbury schooling and um, what's that other one called again? Montessori schooling and mm -hmm. all these different sort of approaches that have like approval and track record of working. Obviously, they still have to operate within a capitalist framework because we live in a society, <laughs> but <laughs> there is a precedent there and we should be looking to see what we can learn from them. Yeah. I was just going to say that like a lot of the commune ones were the ones that had a lot of those struggles <laughs> yeah, and yeah. they were easier to dismantle uh, in many aspects. Like the democratic schools are actually pretty cool, <laughs> but from what I've seen, uh, yeah, they are. Um, but what you actually had reminded me of, like, as soon as you kind of said, like the libraries and um, kind of looking at ways in order to not isolate yourself was there's a book called Silk, Stockings, and Socialism, um, which is talking a lot about uh, the textile labor union or the full-fashioned uh, full hosiery union in Philadelphia. Um, and towards the end of it, they start talking about a lot of the stuff that the union had done, which I think is actually really cool that could be brought in that actually um, build on what you were saying and actually reuse that, which is that they kind of developed their own little like housing communities where they would give uh, usually union members, but uh, anyone who really needed it, a house in those communities. And these communities, each of them, uh, the ones they had planned, they only really built one, but each of the ones they had planned were ones that had like sports uh, facilities. They had a school for kids, even if the mom, uh, even if the mother wasn't working. So like if she was a housewife, um, right. cause they're like, Hey, we like people need to get a break. <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, and they had like, you know, the libraries and all these just different kind of community centers that were built around like building the actual community and trying to build that into like Philadelphia itself. Yeah. Um, and so as you were talking, like I was sitting here thinking it's like that it would actually be like a really good way of handling that, <laughs> like building these kind of community centers that everyone could come live in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I would add to that and say that, um, I don't know, something about what you said just now sort of clicked something in me um, and reminded me of something, which is that when we are approaching this sort of anarchist schooling method, I want us to also remember um, to de-school our own minds and shed the assumptions about education, about schooling that comes from the public schooling model, right? So, for example, shed the assumption that school has to take place five days a week shed the assumption that school has to happen in one building in one day. Shed the assumption that school has to take place from a set time in the morning to a set time in the afternoon. Shed the assumption that subjects have to be strictly segregated, you know? Shed the assumption that the real learning takes place in the classroom and all the other stuff is just quote-unquote field trips. Shed the assumption that the best way to measure a child's understanding is through a test. Shed the assumption that everyone's milestones, every child's milestones are going to be the same, you know? Shed the assumption that there are these certain markers that every child must reach and understand that not everyone's going to reach certain markers due to, um, you know, personality or ability or whatever the case may be, you know? Shed the whole, so in fact, shed the whole <laughs> ableist framework of public schooling with regard to attendance and attention and class length and accessibility as a whole, all those different things. Um, teaching styles, shed the assumption that the, the only teaching style to have is this 
teacher led delivery approach you know um sort of speech approach lecture approach and um i'm sure there's so many other things i could say shed <laughs> <laughs> shed the assumption that blah 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 but i think people would be able to get the picture from here um there are a lot of things that are embedded in people's idea of school and idea of education that if you don't shed them you're just going to be replicating the same problems of schooling with less of the resources and that's just going to stress you out understand that having less resources can actually be a benefit in a way because it helps you to strip down to what is actually essential and what is just busy work what is just fluff what is just things to occupy the child's time because the school exists as a daycare center for working parents <laughs> you know also shed the idea that like students or like the children need to be monitored all the time like leave them to be alone leave them to be unstructured you know they're not gonna light a fire <laughs> they'll be fine you know no like i agree 100 percent with all of that <laughs> Because like, especially when you said something about resources, because um, I, I typically work in like international schools, which are mixed at best. <laughs> like there are some that are, you know, considered to be really great because they have a lot of resources. When you said and, international yeah. school, um, yeah. my mind immediately <laughs> went to the, the international schools in Trinidad, which are literally mm. the havens of the less than one percent of white people in Trinidad. <laughs> yeah it's it's not really a big difference across the planet <laughs> um it, and it's also quite weird like you know coming from kind of a lower class background and then working in that area where you're kind of like what is going on but yeah. it's also really strange because even though they are havens for very wealthy people um and also have are seen as like spaces where um where kids are learning like the global skills or whatever so they can go to like you know the us the uk australia for university or whatever um right even though they they're supposed to be that or that's how they're seen uh very frequently you'll be in one and you literally have nothing like as a teacher you're kind of going like what what am i supposed to be doing here like i think i have a textbook somewhere and that's about it um right. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's like whenever you do, like you don't have those resources, um, it does kind of force you to be a lot more creative with what you're doing and like what you're getting. Because you also know that like, even if it again, it is a private school, um, which I have my own issues with. But you know, like even if it's a private school, like that they're not going to give you tons of money to go buy all the stuff you want. <laughs> right. So it really does force you to sit there going like, okay, so what do I need to do? How do I need to do this? And and it's really kind of nice as well, because like you can take that same skill, like even though I am applying it to a place that I wish I weren't, um, <laughs> you know, like I can still take that outside and I can still work with like, you know, local families who might want that or. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's about being resourceful and innovative. <laughs> In a non-capitalist way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like there's a there's just a whole range of and it is quite like interesting because you do start realizing a lot of the um you, a lot of the things that you actually should be focusing on. Because like if you don't have the textbooks, if you don't have access to um, you know, like the stereotypical materials, you're sitting there going, like, okay, so uh like I usually teach literature. And it's like, so what do I need to teach with the writing component of this? How do I do that and do it without any of the materials other than the kids' notebooks? <laughs> right. So it just, it does lead to a lot of creativity or even just like being able to, because um, I like the idea of just, you know, dismantling things to rebuild them. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That the, the, um, or she's a quote related to that the creative potential destruction or something like that yeah <laughs> something like isn't it colin ward <laughs> i think so something yeah, so it's along those lines yeah <laughs> he nodded for me so it's like yeah <laughs> <laughs> um i really appreciate that you took the time to kind of join us and talk a little bit about homeschooling and your experience thanks for having me on honestly this conversation um brought out a lot in me 
um, ideas that I guess were sort of lurking just below the surface. So this has invigorated me in a way. So thanks for this conversation. Really appreciate being here. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) I am so appreciative of Andrew taking the time to talk with us. If you liked what you heard, please go check out his YouTube channel at St. Andrewism. And if you want to hear more from us at the APN, go to our website at anarchistpedagogies.net, where you can find out more information and links to our social media, along with any events that we're putting on. All links will be provided in the show notes, and thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.